So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Susan Bradley. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm always pleased to have a chance to talk about this issue, which is very clear, uh, warmed my heart. I have to start, though, by apologizing that I have gastroesophageal reflex syndrome, and I lose my voice if I don't chew gum when I'm trying to talk, so I apologize. Um, uh, the I was explaining earlier to Candace uh, how this field has changed, uh, and partially it's changed because in the last 20 years, uh, we have experienced this phenomena called ROGID, which I, I'm sure you all understand, um, which has really shifted things in terms of the number of kids who have considered that they are trans and are being referred to our clinics. But not only is that changed, the way of trying to respond to them, I'm sure most of you are very aware of, which is the affirmative model, has meant that there is relatively little um, assessment, really, uh, of the way these uh, youngsters think and feel before they are capable of making a decision, at least in the US, no longer in the UK, uh, in Canada, somewhere in between. But b before they are able to uh, decide that they're going to be on puberty blockers and eventually uh, same sex or opposite sex hormones and even operations. Um, so the, the speed that that has happened has left us all, I think, those of us who started out in this work who were fairly uh, cautious about all of this, uh, we weren't sure that we always knew what we were dealing with. <laughs> I can tell you that in the early days, the only other label that I used to apply to these kids, even when they were young, when you're not supposed to apply labels like this, but it was borderline personality disorder. And it took uh, almost until I left the clinic about 10 or 15 years ago that I began to be aware that that was high functioning autism that we were talking about. But, and that didn't happen for me. Uh, until I left the academic session uh, situation and started working uh, as a consultant to children's mental health centers uh, around here. And in those settings, I was dealing with well-trained um, social workers, psychologists, and uh, youth, child and youth workers, all of whom had been trained in CBT and the usual techniques that are uh, useful. And these kids were being sent to me because these techniques weren't working. And this really um, made me wake up to the realization that this was uh, a population of kids that we had probably missed by calling them borderline personality disorder. And um, I also began to take a real interest in, in that at this time and realized that many of my colleagues have not been comfortable making the diagnosis on higher functioning children for a variety of reasons. I mean, just the notion of giving anybody a psychiatric diagnosis is something that many people recoil from. And so uh, if children seem to be functioning, they obviously would not get a diagnosis. Um, and many of the higher functioning kids, especially the girls, and I'll, I'll explain about the boys in a minute, um, oftentimes the girls had a, enough social understanding to hang in on the fringes of their groups. Uh, they, they, they never were fully accepted and they nearly always felt that something was wrong with them, but they couldn't label it. That was how it all came across as they approached puberty. The boys sometimes um, had some more overt um, signs and uh, more overt difficulties and could get um, sort of left out 
even earlier, but the kids who had good sports talents or something like that oftentimes could find a group of kids that accepted them because they were good at that. And so uh, going back, um, the, the, the history, the presentation of these young people was much different from those who were overtly autistic, which is the group that we had always studied and thought we knew a lot about. But more recently, what has been happening is that there have been a lot of brain studies, brain function studies, looking at schizophrenia, bipolar illness, ADHD, and autism spectrum disorder. And what is emerging from that is that the, the abnormalities in the brains of that group of people are more similar than different. The, there's a gradient here. You, uh, you can imagine that some of the areas that are highly disturbed in schizophrenia are less disturbed in the ASD population, but there's still weaknesses, if, if you want to think of that, in that same population. So they would have a, a curve that's slightly lower, whereas the others would have a curve that's slightly higher. And what is really important is that when you do family histories, oftentimes when you're looking at kids in the autism spectrum, you will find a family history of somebody who's had a psychotic illness. Nearly all of the kids in uh, the ASD group have symptoms of ADHD, but not all ADHD kids have symptoms of ASD. <laughs> so th there are sort of lumps and, and uh, valleys here. But the, the other thing is that uh, there's a very good researcher um, who worked on a long-term study of kids in, in Australia. And he looked at uh, people, uh, really a, a large population of people and followed them up to, I think it was mid twenties roughly. And he was able to do brain studies on a lot of these people over time. And so he has come out and said that there is, when somebody has some kind of psychiatric illness, there is one factor which he has given the name a P factor. Those of you who have talked uh, about kids in education and things will know that we have a, a, a factor which assesses IQ. And he's saying this is the same kind of thing, but it's, it's the person's ability to manage their emotions, which is absolutely critical. And what has happened as well is that there was work uh, at several different levels now where uh, people have looked at, at the borderline personality population and said they look much more like the high functioning autism population than they do like anybody else. And they are, one would have to guess, um, really right in there somewhere in, in all of what I'm describing and not, not honestly separate from uh, any of this. And we've known that they have real trouble with emotion regulation. And uh, the kids in the high functioning autism spectrum, that's one of the keynote factors that uh, life is difficult for them because they they have problems when they get dysregulated, getting re-regulated. My grandson uh, has this and he has real meltdowns at times over absolutely minor kinds of things that happen. And it's extremely difficult for my daughter, who's the main parent, to try to help him get back to normal. If any of you have experienced anything like that, you'll understand how how long that process stays in your head. You don't just let go of it. And uh, Steve Porges, uh, a psychologist, um, I, I can't remember wh wh where he was affiliated, but a number of years ago wrote a book about uh, vagal nerve function and arguing that the vagal nerve is the key um, part of our brain system, our nervous system.
for re-regulating us. There's a sympathetic system which makes us want to do fight or flight, and there's a parasympathetic system that wants helps us calm down. And that parasympathetic system regulates our hearts, our lungs, um, all of those systems that have to stay working properly for a, a person to, to function well. And he studied kids in the autism spectrum and their vagal nerve function, that parasympathetic part, is not working very well. So he's made reference to the fact that they're in a state of fight or flight way too long for it to be good for them. Uh, and that was really helpful to me as I was sort of trying to get my head around all of this. And a woman named Holly Bridges uh, in, the, in Australia wrote a, a fairly interesting book about 10 years ago. It didn't get a great deal of play except amongst some people who knew about Steve Porges, I think. But she argued that unless you help these individuals learn to regulate their feelings, you can't really make any progress. And this gets back to the, the, the skilled clinicians that I was dealing with who were saying, <laughs> I can't work with this person. And part of the problem was that we, we didn't really know how to help them regulate their feelings well. We're learning, but there's a lot we haven't learned. And, you know, in the past, we've used large doses of psychotropics, uh, antipsychotic things and all of this for kids who get really way out of it. And, and most of those have horrible side effects. So it's not ideal to have only one strategy for trying to help kids learn to regulate themselves. A part of the, the, the complexity in all of this is that until we get enough agreement about what, how widely distributed some of these characteristics are in the population, it's very hard to get good research done. Uh, the, there was a study a number of years ago done uh, on patient, patients who failed three trials of medication for their um, depression. And they implanted a device right on the breastbone. It's called a vagal nerve stimulator. And those people had a recovery, uh, actually a cure rate, not, not a recovery rate, and there's a difference in that. A cure rate is really good. We very seldom get cure rates in, in psychiatry. It was up around um, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, which has never been heard of. That, that's what's amazing about some of this stuff. We, most people don't want to have some kind of device implanted under their skin, and it's costly and can cause infections. So people have been looking at other ways of doing vagal nerve stimulation as one of the ways of trying to get people so that they can calm enough to manage themselves when this dysregulation starts. Uh, there's a device available in England and I've been getting a lot of people to try to use it. Uh, generally people who use it say that, that it really does help, but, but that's not a scientific study. <laughs> uh, and that's where we've got to get more information about that part of brain function. But, you know, we know in the autistic population that there's problems with the gut, uh, there's problems with the immune system, and all of these things are related to the autonomic nervous system. So I think we have knowledge now about some of the things that we could start working on more uh, vigorously. Uh, we've just got to do it. Uh, and in the meantime, <laughs> these kids are getting into all kinds of difficulties. Uh, you're all familiar with the trans issue and how many kids who seem to be vulnerable in different ways, uh, these uh, high functioning autistic kids coming into puberty tend to feel extremely left out and they don't know how to navigate that whole psychosocial, psychosexual kind of thing. Um, 
they do not understand what's wrong with them. Uh, they don't understand their difficulty in social interaction and they keep trying, but the failures are, are such that they're often simply left out or rejected. And that's horrible for their self-esteem. These kids, unless they've got something that they're really good at, often feel that they're just losers. And, you know, very few of them are losers, but they end up feeling that way. Um, so it, it's a dilemma at the moment for how do we help them manage this transition to adulthood? Um, and nobody has, quotes the answers. And, and that's a great long uh, thing to say, I can't answer some of your questions because <laughs> we don't have enough of the kind of uh, studies that really have tried out various kinds of things. Uh, the, I, I've mentioned the fact that we're starting to look at, at connections between a lot of these different disorders. And as we do that, uh, people are beginning, I think, to try different things. But for the population of kids who tend to get into difficulties around their gender, the other things that they're also very vulnerable to are anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal thinking. That's a very high index. And even after they've gone through transition uh, and, and in the boys, there, if you look at some of the, the individuals who've been involved in the school shootings and things like that, whether you actually can see that they've had a diagnosis or not. Many of them were loners and they felt left out. Here in Toronto, we had a, a man who took a van and, and ran down our main street and killed a whole bunch of women. And uh, he was later, uh, he, he acknowledged that he was uh, a, um, oh, this is my trouble with, with words. He feels that women will have nothing, nothing to do with this group of men. I can't remember. Somebody else will know the name. But he was clearly in the spectrum. And I've been taking an interest in the histories of a lot of these where I can get the information. And I'm convinced that a lot of these men were vulnerable because what they tend to do, the boys more than the girls, is they become venge vengeful. They, they feel that they have a right to seek vengeance. And even many of them are the rest of their own lives because a lot of them get killed or kill themselves. So there are these populations of kids who have graduated into being adults who are really struggling. Um, another friend of mine, she's a colleague who, who, whose son is in the spectrum, has written a book about here in Canada, our services that help these kids transition into uh, adult life are, are really inadequate. And so many of them, they may get through school, but they don't have a whole lot of support and then they're trying beyond that. So it's, it, it's a hard slog and it's a hard slog for parents. The ones who get pulled into the uh, trans, trans um, identification, in my mind at least, get a sense that these people accept me. They know who I am. They've labeled me as trans, trans and, and that must be what I am. But it makes me feel I've at least been accepted. And it's, that's the, the in adolescence, one of the key things is most of you will remember is that people want, uh, they want friends to accept them. They want, uh, 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 I'm going to use the word marital, uh, partners um, who love them and think they're great. Many of these kids will identify as um, homosexual and lesbian or uh, gay or um, in between, uh, but there is still enough uh, difficulty accepting 
the LGBTQ uh, community that, that it's also not exactly okay. So even though they may find a partner and feel better, they may still struggle with whether, you know, we're just as good as anybody else. Uh, and I, I have a story that I'll tell, it's brief. Um, we were following a, a young man. He, he came to us when he was nine or 10 from one of the agencies that I later um, consulted with, but he, came because he's had a very conflicted and difficult early childhood. He'd been in care for a number of years. And he was like nearly all of the kids that we were seeing at that time, he was pretty convinced that he should be a girl. And uh, we, we had a pattern of, of providing a, a reasonable amount of therapy to everybody. And he was getting some in the uh, agency and, and we would keep a track on how he was doing. And we thought he was going on to transition. We were quite, quite convinced. Uh, we saw him over about five or six years. And I was consulting to the same agency, so I would bump into him every once in a while. And one day when I came in the door, uh, he was coming out the door, and I thought, God, he looks good. And I said, Frankie, you look just great. And he looked at me, and he said, I'm not trans anymore. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> he was in an LGBT group and he'd met another boy and they fell in love and that solved his problem. And, you know, I, we all sort of poo poo the idea of how <laughs> sort of falling in love is something that, you know, isn't that important, but it really is important. And it's important for people to be accepted uh, by somebody who loves them. And parental love isn't quite the same <laughs> as falling in love with a peer. So I'm becoming an advocate of uh, alternate kinds of experience for many of these kids. And the groups provide one access to other people and opportunities to talk about yourself because there's trans kids there, there's gay and lesbian kids. You don't have to be anything, um, but you, you talk about it. And uh, some of that talking can be helpful. Uh, and the other sort of thing that I'm also advocating for, uh, and this comes from, uh, I had a colleague whose daughter was clearly in the spectrum, and, but never diagnosed, but she was gifted. And she was in classes for gifted throughout her school career. And I saw her uh, shortly after I left that agency and said, you know, how's your daughter doing? She said, well, She's still got issues. She's going to university next year. And, but, you know, she still calls me when she gets home from school to say, what can I eat? And uh, she, mom knew clearly, you know, what her difficulties were. But the parents of that group of kids had formed a protective coating, if you want to call it that. The kids, I suspect a lot of the other kids were in the same growth. And they liked each other and they they were their friends. So having a friend who loves you and likes you <laughs> is really important for most teens. And if we can do anything about the opportunities for them, that can make a difference.